Hi, good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining me for those who are still able to see these videos. I'll not get into the question of censorship, but I'm continuing that process of challenging and breaking new uh, fronts in, around the science of COVID-19. For anyone who knows me, I always talk about autoimmunity because I'm completely sure that this is the relevant thing to understand at this stage. If we had understood it before, I think that mistakes wouldn't have been made in the pandemic. However, now it's time to try and pull back and take stock of what we need to learn. And so I think it's important that I capture what it is I'm trying to do. And so I realized that because of the research looking at COVID from multiple angles, I need to integrate it and put it in a way that is as easy as possible for people who want to understand the science around it to understand and to be able to use and implement. Because this is not over, sadly. Now, some people may argue that this is now just a cold virus, but I'm certainly in the GERT handbook when Gert says that there is a problem coming, the question is when? And so this is what has caused me to get thinking. So I'm going to be talking about what I think is the new presentation of COVID. This is what I think, and this is based on <clears throat> research, thinking about what I observe clinically, and trying to integrate it into the pattern around autoimmunity. And so within that framework, before I start talking about that today, just want to remind people, this is for people who are really interested in the details. And this is looking at a first section of my advanced COVID-360, because I'm trying to capture all the thoughts, looking at the viruses, the variants, origin of the virus, how it enters, that kind of thing. So if you're interested in that, um, please click on the link below and you can join us on this journey. That's just going to be the first of probably six or seven modules. It's going to take a while to put all of them together. And for those people who have been on these courses before, the style will always be very simple, is that I have a number of slides. We do it in subsections. At the end of each subsection, we stop and we discuss to make sure that what I'm putting across works, I take the questions and answers. So if you're interested, please click on the link below and join us on this research journey as I try and put together the pandemic from my own research perspective. So let's get back into what I think is going to be the new COVID lung disease. Now, very important that I don't think we're going to see severe COVID-19 in the way that we saw it in the early part of the pandemic, because the mechanism was very clear cut. It was about a delayed interferon response. And now the whole world has either had infection, so they have natural immunity, or they have hybrid immunity. That means that they either had the infection and then got vaccinated, or they had the vaccine and then got infected. So that's where the world is at the moment. The problem is, is that COVID continues to circulate. And for those who think this is just a common cold, you just need to look at the capacity of this virus. This is a beast. And this is something that really, it should have been clarified exactly where this came from because we've never seen anything like this. So this is not over. The question is, what is going to happen next? So as I thought about the presentation, so to speak, I then had to think about how does this relate with what happens with the virus? So I'm going to take you through a few slides and I'm going to show you a paper. And this is what it is going to be about here. So COVID-19 and a pulmonary fibrosis, a potential role for lung epithelial cells and fibroblasts. The critical word in here is pulmonary fibrosis. This was a paper that was from May 2021. And in combination with the recent Dutch autopsy study, I've kind of integrated the thoughts to try and see if I can get a clear idea as to what I think is like. Let me rephrase it. This is already happening. We just don't know how bad it's going to get. That's the simplest way that I can put it. This is not an idea of what could happen. 
I'm telling you what's happening already. It's just I'm not sure if this is going to explode in the way that I am worried about. So when we look at, um, I'll show you here what it is that I'm talking about. So I've got here a slide, and this is just showing a healthy alveoli. And so this here is the lung. You have two lungs, left and right. Uh, this is the trachea and the bronchi, um, bronchi, and then you bring air in and out, and that's how you breathe. And this, these lungs are broken down into lobules, and then the lobules are then broken down into alveolar sacs, okay? And there are millions of them. This is an example of one, and this is the basic unit of getting oxygen into your bloodstream. This here is a blood vessel, tiny capillary, and you can see the red blood cells here. And what happens is that there is such a thin distance here that when oxygen is in this part of the alveolus, it goes across into the bloodstream and it's picked up by the red blood cells. They then carry it around to the heart and it's pumped around the body. Very simple system. So it's deoxygenated here. It has given it up in the veins and it's coming back. It then gets oxygen around here and then it goes on to carry oxygen to the rest of the body. Here are the pieces of the puzzle. One. The macrophage, alveolar macrophages are always there. They're protecting the cells. Here we have along the sides, these very thin cells are what we call alveolar epithelial cells, type 1. And then these bigger looking cells are alveolar epithelial cells, type 2. These are the ones that produce a, a, a product called a surfactant, which keeps the alveoli open all the time so they don't close down on each other. And then in green outside here, I have fibroblasts. These are the cells that create healing. So if you had a, uh, they're also in the skin, they're everywhere. Every time you have any damage, the fibroblasts produce collagen and rebuild. So they are always in the lungs as well. And then you have here the lining, the endothelial cells of the capillary. So it's a very tight unit. And as I said, there are millions of them in the lung. So that's the basis of where we had severe COVID-19. So in that, in that region, you then had the cytokine storm and there was damage and fluid and you couldn't breathe. Plus there are microthrombi in the blood vessels. That's the severe COVID-19. And this is what it kind of looked like using a similar image. And you can see here, and uh, these here represent the virus. And the virus then also impacts on the macrophages. The macrophages get activated because they're trying to fight the infection. They produce all these cytokines. Other white blood cells come in, and then you have this cytokine storm. And the cytokine storm causes swelling. It produces fibrin. This is from the fibroblast. Fluid leaks out, so you can't exchange oxygen. And that's severe COVID-19. And this is the bit that I said, it's not going to present this way again. I think that that kind of presentation, while it can occur, is going to be relatively rare. We're not going to see ICUs full of people with sudden shortness of breath, like what happened early in the pandemic. Question is, what is going to happen? And that's the bit with the fibrosis that I was talking about. And this is what it would kind of look like. And this here on the right is a normal healthy lung. And you can see these bronchioles going down and they branch down and you have these nice little bubbles. And this is healthy lung tissue and you can easily exchange oxygen. That works very well. In this case here, on this bit here, this looks healthy, but everything else here is deformed, it's fibrosed, it's irregular. And this is what is lung fibrosis. Question is, is why do I think that this is relevant at this period of time? Now, as I said, the Dutch autopsy study was very, very important. And even though they didn't tell us the vaccination status of the individuals, you could surmise some important information. And so this is one of the tables that was looking at the histology across the cases that the lung cases that they looked at. And as I pointed out before, in red is the highest frequency. So at the red is, is highest frequency, blue is low frequency, zero. 
here is the microthrombi, and that's severe COVID-19. And you can see microthrombi was largely through uh, the period of time, because you can see this is 0 to 7, 8 to 14, 15 to 21, up to greater than 56 days. And they have here the numbers of cases that they were looking at, 27, 32, 20, 21, and so on. The bit that stood out to me then and is standing out to me now is two things. One, organizing diffuse alveolar damage, which is different from the acute. And so you can see this is occurring all the way through. And this is the precursor to lung fibrosis. And so this is already happening in the cases that people had severe COVID-19. Some of these died, some survived, so they already have a degree of um, lung fibrosis, but it may not be symptomatic. Here is the fibrosis itself. And again, we can see all the way through, from about day eight, all the way through, fibrosis is occurring. So we know this occurs in severe COVID-19, the question is, will it also occur in the context of what I think is the re-exposure component? Now, I haven't put the slides together for this, and this is the kind of thing that I would probably be doing in terms of the uh, advanced course. But there is an important thing to reflect on, and this is what I think Gert is referring to. At the moment, and I'll show you this here. So this is the virus here coming down into the alveoli. Interestingly, Omicron doesn't do this as well as the original variants. It tends to stick much higher up in the bronchioles. And so people tend to have this chronic cough, bronchitis, rather than the acute severe lung infection that occurred with the earlier variants. But this is just purely down to the entry mechanism of Omicron. What I think is likely to happen is that because the variants are continually being produced, I think it's a matter of time before one of these variants gets back the capability that the original variants had in terms of entry mechanism. When it does that, it's going to go much deeper in the lungs. That's where I anticipate that the presentation will no longer be that of severe COVID-19, but a relatively rapid progression of lung fibrosis. So people will have, say, an infection, and they recover, you know, three weeks down the line or four weeks down the line, they find that they're feeling a bit more short of breath. And over time, this just continues to progress. And when we finally do the scans, we see evidence of what we call interstitial lung disease or fibrosis. The problem with it is that we don't have any treatments for it. And Professor Uhal, who I've been working with for a long time, he is um, one of the top ACE2 pulmonary researchers. And that's what his lifetime research has been around, pulmonary fibrosis. And so we know just how complex it is and just how difficult it is to manage and treat and so this is a really serious issue because if it is rapid onset, as what I think, you suddenly don't have sudden deaths, but you will find people would die in there for two to six months. And it would seem logical because this is just somebody who has pulmonary fibrosis. It's just what could happen. But the numbers are what I am concerned about would be exceptionally high. That's what I think based on the research because it's likely to be autoimmune. And when we look at, um, actually, I'll show you, let me just take this off for a second. I'll show you why I think that this was so important. This is why I had the, the paper um, present here. And it's showing us the current understanding around pulmonary fibrosis, excessive deposition in the lung of the um, fibrin and it highlights the epithelial cells as the initiator and i pointed out the type 1 and the type 2 um, epithelial cells in the lungs and the critical one and as we go down here you can see here the fibroblasts that i showed as well these are the ones that cause the fibrosis but critically 
these fibroblasts are activated by the type 2 epithelial cells. And these cells, the type 2 epithelial cells, will have ACE2 on them. And so just as a final point with regards to the, uh, the image, let me just show it to you again. This here is what it would look like. The virus would then trigger these epithelial cells. They become infected, they become activated, there'll be cytokines around. They would then trigger these fibroblasts to start producing fibrin. And then over time, we'd have deposition of fibrin and uh, tightening of this region, poor exchange of oxygen. And if this is happening in millions of these alveoli over time, it then creates quite significant problems. And just to remember, this is definitely occurring, as you can see here, the fibrosis. This is definitely occurring quite quickly, within 8 to 14 days already, in the context of severe COVID-19. I think it will take a little longer, if I'm correct, but yes, this is pretty serious stuff. So the question is, how do we prepare for the future? One is education. And so this is part of the reason why I've made the determination, even though it takes me a lot of time to put it together. Join me on this um, part one of this course, and we'll be going through it in a bit more detail. It'll take us about an hour in sections and questions. Um, but the best way of finding solutions is to understand what we're up against. And um, I hope that this is valuable to you. And as usual, I look forward to speaking to you all in the near future. Have a great evening.